look, what's happening right now with gold and the bonds? Why would any country, like, look at China. They used to have almost three trillion in treasuries. They're down to just over 700 billion. Why would any country want to hold any of our debt of any duration when this stuff is happening? When we go around the world imposing sanctions on everyone and now confiscating those assets. And, you know, it, it's okay for us to do it, but you can't. So, but hey, take our debt, please. We we need to, to build our military because we've borrowed um, all this money to other countries that we really don't have. But why would anyone want to hold our debt of any duration whatsoever? And the answer is they won't, because we've chosen inflation over austerity. We know that if we raise rates, we blow everything up. If we lower rates and inject inflation and signal that we will never balance uh, or, or normalize our balance sheet and let the inflation engine engine run, well, it leads to the same place of higher interest rates. And so today's market recap, silver price plunges over 3% back beneath $27. Silver drops to 26.29 amid a strengthening U.S. dollar and rising Treasury yields, influenced by higher employment costs. Technical support is identified near $26.12. A rebound above $27 could set the stage for silver to target the recent high of $27 and challenge the $28 resistance level. Silver's price dropped sharply late in the North American session as the greenback staged a comeback bolstered by the rise in U.S. Treasury yields. The rise in the U.S. Employment Cost Index, ECI, reignited talks that the Federal Reserve might delay its rate cuts due to inflation pressures. If silver recovers and edges back above the $27, that could open the door to retesting higher prices. Subsequent gains are seen above the April 26 high at $27.73. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview. Make sure you watch the video to the end to make the most out of it. Enjoy the episode. So the other day, right, we saw 7,560 gold kilo bars that were shipped out of the Comex, okay? That's $571 million worth of gold, 243,054 ounces. Who's got that kind of bread, right? So it was all shipped through to Hong Kong Brinks. The exchange for physical is a way where you can buy a contract on the COMEX and exchange it for physical, typically in London. But if it's done in the OTC market, the over-the-counter, the two participants can negotiate and say, I'll take it here. And they can even negotiate, I believe, in the form of the gold. You want gold eagles? Fine, we'll deliver it there. But anyways, the OTC is, in respect to Brinks in Hong Kong, almost all of the, and this is a COMEX-approved vault, right? It, almost all of these transactions that go to Hong Kong, Brinks, are OTC, right? Almost all of them, or excuse me, E exchange for physical, almost all of them, right? And so what happens is, is that you had 243,000 ounces get delivered in the OTC market in exchange for physical to Brinks, Hong Kong. And what happens then is that once the gold arrives in Hong Kong, the trade is unwound in COMEX, and the bars are then transported by armored truck to the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So Again, we've been saying this forever. These people are using the suppression of the Western market against us. They they short the price on uh, on Comex. They they then take uh, purchase the physical at a subsidized price and stand for delivery in Hong Kong and then move it to the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And look at the deliveries off the Shanghai Gold Exchange. They're off the charts. So they're bleeding dry, the LBMA and the COMEX, having it moved to, by exchange for physical, to Hong Kong and then driven over by armored car to the Shanghai Gold Exchange where they take delivery. I mean, you can't make it up. And, and between the Shanghai Gold Exchange, um, where those purchases are like cash and carry, and the Shanghai Futures Exchange, the combined average daily volume over the past two months has increased more than 200%, and it now exceeds the average trading volume of the New York COMEX market. Effectively, that now makes Shanghai the world's second largest gold trading market 
after the London Bullion Market Association. Little by little by little by little. Do you not see it, you guys? Over 200% in the past few months. Hmm, interesting. And it's all exchanged for physical. Interesting. And it just happens to end up at Brinks Hong Kong, which is a COMEX-approved vault. And then it just happens to find its way to the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and the deliveries are off the charts. Hmm. See the bigger picture? If not, you're going to get rolled over by this when it all breaks. I hope people do. And if you look, China's net gold imports via Hong Kong in March rose about 40% from the previous month. They continue, continue, continue to slowly increase, and the media does nothing to tell us what's happening. In today's market recap, uh, silver price falls to three-week low near 2670 with eyes on Fed policy meet. Silver price tumbles to 2670 as U.S. yields rise ahead of Fed policy. The Fed is expected to keep interest rates steady with hawkish guidance. Investors should be prepared for high volatility this week as the U.S. non-farm payrolls will follow the Fed's policy. The white metal faces a sharp sell-off after breaking below the crucial support of 27. The asset faces pressure as the U.S. Treasury yields rise amid caution ahead of the Federal Reserve's monetary policy announcement on Wednesday. The U.S. dollar index, which tracks the U.S. dollar's value against six major currencies, bounces back to 105.90. The U.S. dollar's appeal improves ahead of a data-packed week. This week, investors will focus on the ISM manufacturing PMI and the non-farm payrolls NFP report for April, which will be published on Wednesday and Friday, respectively. Now we'll show you the best excerpts of the latest interview. But first, hit the like button, smash the subscribe button, and turn on the notifications bell so you do not miss out on our daily videos. Enjoy the episode. So the Fed's trapped and they know it. Why would anyone hold these long-term duration bonds? And so, you know, when you talk about um, the banks, right? Um, ultimately, I've said for a very, very, very long time that interest rates spike to the moon as as people dump our treasures. Well, it's happening. The little by little by little, it's happening. You can see it. Now, we're supposed to believe that the United Kingdom and Ireland and the Cayman Islands are, are you know, next to the Federal Reserve will be the biggest holders of our debt. The UK is going to pass uh, China here very quickly. And Jim Willie, I love the guy. He's got courage to say things I don't. He says that Ireland and UK and Cayman are being funneled money by the Fed under the table to do this. Because why the hell would they want our treasuries too? They're, they're not dumb. They see what's happening. And to keep the game going a little bit longer, we have a situation where the countries that were always buying our treasuries are now selling them and replacing it with oil and gold. Because these are assets that have no counterparty risk and are demanded across the majority of the globe. It's a new system where gold and oil are being remonetized, in my mind, in favor of the U.S. Treasury. You're seeing de-dollarization and de-treasurization. So when you talk about a bank that failed, well, yeah, look at all the 185 banks that you mentioned on Razor's Edge. What will break it? Rates rising. Well, you know, Powell said that that um, his mentor uh, was, uh, what's his name, um, the, the former uh, Paul Volcker. Volcker was his mentor for raising rates to 18 and three quarters percent, right? Well, he ain't no Paul Volcker because he realized that he got, you know, you get to 5% on the 10-year treasury, you, you're going to have things start to break. And he's not doing that. So how about the villain theory that I've talked about endlessly? Make people say, what the hell is going on in the United States? And look what they're doing around the world and they're broke. We don't want it anymore. And besides, they're going green. We, they don't want to be part of the oil gang. And so besides, all those guys are now joining the BRICS. It's time to, to go move another way. And all these countries dump dollars. Or they just say we're not taking dollars for oil anymore. I mean, you can see it. And, and maybe this is why you're seeing the yen so low to keep that carry trade going, to keep the dollar strong. I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on anymore other than to say ultimately I see rates going much higher, much higher, because there is no way they can ever normalize the balance sheet. Either the whole thing blows up or they choose inflation. It's one or the other, and there is no other way they can do it. And rates will go higher. What does that mean for the banks? What does that mean for the insurance companies? So yeah, when you talk about the great taking, the risk, and 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 how undercapitalized and over leveraged this whole system is, including the FDIC, which during this banking funding cost the FDIC six hundred and sixty-seven million. That they only have one point what one point eight billion in their account. 
or less than that, backing 18 trillion. So, I mean, how, how many more banks? This is a small one. How many more can fail before? Boom. I don't know. Well, now, because of the weaponization of assets and, and the weaponization of, of the dollar and, and the treasury market, you know, I think it was Representative Mooney who asked the Fed for who's taking all the gold, Where's it, who's repatriating all their gold. And even through the Freedom of Information Act, they didn't answer, at least to my knowledge. But I just read an article, and, and I'll, I'll read a little bit of it here, too. Several, several African and Middle Eastern nations have begun withdrawing their gold reserves from the United States in recent months. Nigeria, South Africa, well, that's interesting. Um, those are BRICS members. Well, Nigeria applied and an OPEC member. Ghana, Senegal, Cameroon, Algeria, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. Hmm. Uh, each representing crucial regions in Africa and the Middle East um, to withdraw their gold reserves from the New York Fed. And and so this is this is about counterparty risk again. Why would you trust? This is a this is trust, and we have squandered the trust. And, and that's why you're seeing countries sell treasuries. And that's why you're seeing all of these countries. And all of them are going to apply to the BRICS or in the BRICS or on the Belt Road. Every one of them says we're the next target. So let's let's slowly get our stuff back. Let's slowly uh, extricate ourselves from uh, from the treasury market. I mean, you can see this happening. And it's all put all of these things together that we've talked about today in a bigger context. And then look at it. And, and and this is where Occam's razor comes in. This is where, I, I, I mean, I I try to follow this linear path, but the more stuff I see, it, it just is shocking to me that how fast it's accelerating. And when you see Saudi Arabia and Egypt just happen to be new members to the BRICS, um, repatriate their gold from the Fed, and you can see the amount of, of treasuries they're selling and the amount of gold they're buying, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see those crumbs laid at your feet and where do they lead to? So this is another thing that I think is just um, part and parcel for the times that we are in. And I expect to see greater acceleration over the next few months as we lead to the big BRICS meeting in October. Remember, there were 200 meetings from the beginning of this year to that meeting. So it's every day there'll be something new. And then, of course, God willing, we get a chance to vote in the next election, which I'm hoping we do then uh, I would say that this is, as the Chinese curse says, may you live in interesting times, is going to be the most interesting times that I've ever lived through in my career. What do you think of Schechtman's take? Is he spot on or will he blunder his prediction once again? But most importantly, are you bullish? Post in the comment section if you're bullish despite the massive sell-off and watch this video right here because it's a perfect fit for you. I see you on the other side.